Hello and welcome to this, the fourth in our Technology for the Safe System webinar series organised by RoadSafe to explore how connected technologies can contribute to each of the pillars of the safe system approach to road safety. My name is Nick Reed, and I'm your host for the series. I work in transport technology and road safety through my company Reed Mobility and as Chief Road Safety Advisor to National Highways. I am also a trustee of RoadSafe, which is a charitable organisation that brings together government, industry and research organisations to foster collaboration on road safety topics. We're very grateful to Bosch for their support of this webinar series and to Agilisys for their technical and logistical expertise in arranging these sessions. In our previous webinars, we have looked at the contribution of technology to achieving safe road infrastructure at the National Transport Operations Centre, at the use of technology to improve post-crash care at Northwest Fire Control in Warrington, and at how technologies are delivering safe vehicles, hosted by Thatcham Research at the Upper Hayford Test Track Facility. In our fourth episode, we are moving on to discuss the role of technology in delivering safe speeds. Continuing the theme of hosting each webinar at a location relevant to the discussion, we are today being very kindly hosted by Genoptic at their UK headquarters here in Camberley, out to the southwest of London in Surrey. Genoptic is a global technology company that is a leader in automatic number plate recognition technology used for law enforcement. Through its predecessor companies, it brought the SPECS average speed camera systems to market and also offers parking, back office and data analysis services. Joining me here are four fantastic panellists to discuss how connected technologies can contribute to the safe speeds pillar of the safe system. But before we meet them, we've made a short film this morning to highlight some of the fascinating ways that Genoptic are working in this area. Genoptic is part of a, a big German photonics organisation, but in the UK we're very much focused on enforcement solutions and AMPR based technology and uh, we've been doing this type of technology going way back to I think the late 1970s when we were involved in the initial invention of AMPR and the very first application. And so what we do here in the UK is we design and we make a range of enforcement technologies which are widely used around the UK road network. Well, you, you can see behind me um, there is a, a column with that happens to be a spot speed camera so it has a radar and an AMPR camera and fundamentally the key thing which is at the heart of everything that we do here is the AMPR automatic number plate recognition camera and we have a family we call Vector which has been around since about 2013 and it's been through a number of changes and iterations they all look very similar but fundamentally they are AMPR cameras which are used to read the unique number plate reference on a vehicle and then it's associated with other data. But there's a whole host of other things that we do and that is very much what's in the box. It's, it's the ANPR technology that allows us to do an awful lot of the monitoring technologies that we, um, we develop. One of the really nice innovations that we've got with the latest generation of vector cameras is the synchronised infrared lighting. And the reason that's beneficial is that human eyes are not responsive to infrared or they maybe pick up a very, very dull red glow. Um, not everybody can. And infrared lighting allows you to capture 24 hours a day in complete darkness without dazzling or distracting drivers. And we, we've got a, a patented solution whereby the lighting is actually synchronised with the shutter on the camera, which means it's very low power, very low power requirement, but you get lovely crisp, clear images, even at three o'clock in the morning, without uh, dazzling or distracting the driver. Um, and I believe it's, it's a unique thing that we're able to offer now. Technology moves much faster than type approval or the law. And so that's something always to bear in mind about when will we see something new and different. But there are a lot of innovations in the pipeline. Um, for example, variable average speed limits is something I think we're going to see with average speed cameras, bringing the benefits of both types of technology together. Um, big data usage as well, in that these are basically data capture devices. Home office type approval typically only allows you to do one thing. But you can do many more things with data if it's done appropriately, carefully and usefully. And then finally, I think there will be an increased level of enforcement in 20 mile an hour limits, which historically there has been a little, but not very much. But more and more urban limits are going to 20 miles an hour 
So I think that's an area of growth reinforcement that we're going to see in the short term future. Fantastic video there. So um, we now move on to the discussion and welcome our expert panelists. And I should highlight at this stage that you have the opportunity to ask your questions to the panel by using the chat function. In the last few minutes of the webinar, we'll get to uh, pick up some of your questions and direct them to these panelists. So if we start with uh, Jeff, just saw you on the video there, but uh, yeah, quickly introduction to yourself and, and Genoptic. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Jeff Collins. I'm the deputy MD here for Genoptic. Um, and I, I work for the UK, UK organisation that um, is hosting the event today. And as you saw in the video, we, we bring a range of enforcement technologies to market, both in the UK and internationally. Fantastic. Steve, road safety support. I'm Steve Callahan, I'm the technical support manager and the calibration laboratory manager at Road Safety Support, and where Road Safety Support provides uh, support for the, the UK police uh, and some foreign uh, police forces. Uh, as well as some government departments in the UK in speed enforcement and other enforcement uh, technologies on the road. Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. Welcome. And Richard. Hi there. Yeah, I'm uh, Richard Owen. I'm the CEO of Agenesis. Um, we're a company that carries out uh, research into uh, various aspects of road safety. And one of those um, involves lots of data that's relating to vehicle speeds. We carry out assessments of collision risk. Um, I've been interested in um, the topic of speed for nearly 20 years now, since I first became a safety camera partnership manager um, in Thames Valley. Um, so yeah, it's nice to have had that same um, thread running through my career. Fantastic. Welcome, Richard. And David from TRL. Good afternoon. My name is David Hyde, um, and I'm Chief Scientist for Vehicle Safety Investigations at TRL Transport Research Laboratory. So we're a fully independent uh, transport research organisation with about 250 uh, scientists and engineers looking at all aspects of, of uh, transport and transport safety. Brilliant. Well, lots of expertise on the panel today. Uh, if we can start, Jeff, with you. Um, so you talked in the video there about how Unoptic is a leading supplier of these speed monitoring technologies. Um, how do they really work and, and how are they evolving to support safe speeds on our roads? Okay, um, well, I touched on in the, in the video, um, most of the technology we work with starts with the, the AMPR camera. In the, yeah. uh, that is used to identify uniquely a particular vehicle. And then a few other sensors might be associated with that to allow you to create a violation record. So the thing that we're probably we're most known for, um, the, the SPEPS average speed cameras, there's more than 240 routes in the UK. I think it's about a thousand miles worth of road which right now um, use them. And fundamentally it's very simple. You have an entry camera which monitors a vehicle at that location and then at some point further down the road, be it just a few hundred metres or many kilometres away, there'll be another camera which shows that that vehicle is at the second location a known time later. You know how long the road is, you know what the speed limit is, it means you can very easily work out um, the, the actual speed that has been measured. But um, while it's the technology which is very important, I personally think the thing that's really interesting is the it's more the influence on driver behaviour uh -huh. rather than the technology which is actually being used to detect a violation. And if you do it right, you influence behaviour and you don't actually need to catch people because you've made them do the right thing before you later on have to catch them after the event. And so that's my, my personal view that is a really good enforcement solution is one that only occasionally needs to show its teeth because the mere presence of it at the side of the road, so a large piece of yellow metal, subliminally changes the way that people drive. And, and it has a virtuous circle effect. Um, not only does it reduce the, the speed people are driving at, it seems to steady the flow. Yes. And if you steady the flow, congestion improves, journey reliability gets better. And you have to remember as well that that actually makes the environmental situation better mm -hmm. and quieter. There are fewer emissions. And the final uh, part of the beneficial circle is that it's been more accepted. If people feel it's being done appropriately and reasonably, you take people with you. And I think that's very much part of the picture. So it's actually the change to driver behaviour, which I think is most important, rather than just the actual bits and the bytes of the technology. Yeah. And, and Steve, how have you seen this enforcement technology change and, and what you do in kind of understanding what incidents have occurred and so on. Well, from time to time, on Jeff's adversary, because I test the equipment uh, on behalf of the Home Office. So uh, 
we've been on opposite sides of the fence, but uh, I could see him quite uh, categorically that Jeff's equipment is more than adequate. <laughs> his performance, as, as are others as well, you don't get through all of this type approval unless, uh, unless you, you meet all of the requirements in that house. So I see, I see it from that aspect. Um, so from a technological point of view, um, I see it. I also act as a, an expert witness. Um, uh, Jeff's, so Jeff's uh, staff they provide expert witness services as you're required to do so when you uh, have home office type approval, but the police uh, sometimes ask us to do expert witness mm -hmm. services. So we, we see the challenges uh, that come, but we, uh, we also work on the strategy for the deployments of the equipment. So we work with the police right. and local authorities and national highways um, to work out the best ways to deploy the technology. So we work along with Jeff and look at it. Sometimes we get asked to, to make sure that they comply with some additional mm -hmm. regulations that the, the Home Office put out. And, and Jeff mentioned in the video about the move to um, enforcement of 20 mile per hour speed limits. I think some people criticise those as, as feeling like the, the, the car wants to go faster, it doesn't feel comfortable to drive at that, that lower speed. Do you think there are things that can be done to make 20 miles per hour feel more comfortable? Yes, and I think first, first of all, it is my opinion that the, that, that very premise needs to be very closely examined from a, from a validity point of view, because it, it could come from a, a position of malevolence from mm -hmm. people who are saying, well, you know, 20 miles an hour is far too slow. Um, all of the average speed systems that Home Office type approved in 20 miles an hour ready. But it's important for drivers to, to remember that all, all the cars that are approved for use in the UK can easily be driven at 20 miles an hour as well as their top speed and 20 mile an hour limits. Um, you're allowed to drive at any speed between 1 and 20 miles per hour and the enforcement thresholds that the police have published on a national basis um, are, are more than generous. So you affect it as a de facto uh, maximum speed of 23 miles an hour mm -hmm. you go with the, the published maximum. So it's important to to encourage drivers to that you don't have to drive at 20 mile an hour plus or minus one mile an hour there's the full range of speeds we we drive cars on the on the test track that uh, got power in ex excess of 600 brake horsepower and a top speed of 201 miles per hour one of them and we drive that regularly at 20 miles an hour and it, it does just as well <laughs> at 20 as it does it you know, nearly 200 so uh, i don't have really a great deal of sympathy yes. with, with that premise and, and I'm very suspicious that it, that it comes from uh, not sort of the best of, uh, of sources but it, it is a valid uh, or it's a common yes. challenge uh, so I think people the more 20 mile an hour limits that are deployed around the, the country and certainly wheels are, are going for a, a restricted road default speed of 20 yep. miles per hour we, we all, as drivers, need to very quickly learn to become comfortable with it. Absolutely. But technology background, you, you've got in, in, uh, intelligent speed adaption uh, to take into account for more modern cars, and that's going to be regulated soon. Um, other than putting in loud piercing alarms uh, if, you, if you go over the speed limit. Um, and I think it's more a, a psychological issue than a, a technological issue. Uh, from, from my opinion. Interesting, interesting. Um, and I'm sure we'll, it's a topic we'll, we'll return to in, yes. later in the, in the discussion. Um, Richard, I mean, one of the biggest impacts that we've seen in, in terms of traffic flow and speeds in recent times has been, of course, COVID. I mean, you know, people tending not to travel roads much quieter. And, you know, Agilis is well known for their, their insightful analysis of, of traffic movements. Um, and, you know, I was really fascinated in some of the research you did around the impact of COVID and, and speeds. Can you tell us some more about that research? Uh, certainly. I mean, it, it was a really fascinating time and a strange time for many of us. Um, all of us working at home and not being out on the on roads as much. And that meant that there were there were analysts out there talking to each other. So we run an, uh, an, an, analyst, an analysts community around the UK. And there were people who were already starting to look at their local traffic survey data. People are connected to this 24-7 via web browsers, etc. Yeah. 
and they were noticing the, uh, the spikes in uh, vehicle speeds. And we were seeing that anecdotally, um, lots of reports from you know, senior police officers saying that they were worried about these speeds. So, you know, we were sat there, we were thinking about how we could do something about this. So we gathered together information from about four or five different local authorities and compared that against what we'd normally expect to see on the roads or even in pre-lockdown. Um, and this was analysis that the Department for Transport eventually did themselves as well. But we were able to give a heads up really quite early on, even into April and a few weeks into lockdown. And we saw that huge spike in the number of very high speed um, road users. Um, if, if you look at the increase in the average speeds, they, they were certainly substantial. Um, but it was at the higher end, you know, the 85th percentile speeds, even the 95th percentile speeds. There were some people um, that took it upon themselves to effectively use the roads as a racetrack because they were quiet and they were <laughs> empty. And there were, there were certainly concerns that, you know, as lockdown ended, would people continue to travel at these, you know, for, frankly, ridiculously high speeds? Now, the good news is, I think, is that driving behaviour has returned to normal. We've seen this within some of our own survey data um, that we get from telematic systems, but we also see it within some of the stats that have been published by Department for Transport. So that first lockdown was a very strange and unique event, very low traffic. Um, but I think what it means is that we haven't seen those people exhibiting those very strange and unusual behaviours. So um, it's, it's an interesting psychological question. What is it that makes people behave like this? Um, in, in these scenarios. But yeah, fortunately, we are seeing those lower speeds. But um, at the same time, if you have a look at the um, casualty analysis, there was a spike um, in the rate of the more serious collisions. And we didn't just see that in the UK, we saw that in evidence from Holland. Um, and in the US, despite the fact that they had lockdown, they actually had an increase in the number of casualties on their roads, which is really bizarre. Uh, that was my understanding. So the absolute number of casualties went down, but the, as you say, the rate went up perhaps to do with yes. this increase in speed. The, the rate went up. So, you know, we want, if we want to make our roads safer and you're having increasing traffic, then you need to focus on the rate because if you have more cars on the road, you're likely to have more crashes. What you need to do is make sure that people's exposure to that risk reduces. There was actually one road user group that did see an improvement in their safety rate, and that was cyclists. Um, that's about the only time that's ever happened when the cycling rate changes. And I think that shows that you know, there's something of a cycling safety and numbers effect there, but also does show the, the harm that's caused to uh, vulnerable road users by these big heavy boxes going around the roads. And that brings me to you, David, and, and I, I, I think it sort of follows on nicely. Um, one of the world's leading experts in crash testing. So from a biomechanics perspective, what can be considered a, a safe speed in a typical modern car? Yeah, and I don't think there's, there's one answer to this. So we can look at it from the perspective of the car occupant and the cars have got um, hugely safer for car occupants uh, over the decades with the various uh, regulations that have been introduced right from seat belts right through to um, the various crash test regulations that have been enforced for a, a number of years. Um, and of course, we can look at, look at it from the perspective of a vulnerable road user. Um, and there've also been regulatory requirements and things like your NCAP encouraging better performance for um, things like pedestrian safety. So when a crash has happened, there's also encouragement for um, technologies to avoid the crash in the first place. Um, but if you look at something like frontal crashes, um, frontal car to car crashes, um, the, the um, risk of fatality in those situations has reduced enormously over the years. But there's still uh, a reasonably large group of, of people having serious and, and a risk of fatal injury in those collisions, which is the older occupants. As you get older, your bone strength reduces and the strength of other tissues in the body reduces and you, you, you're still vulnerable to the loads that are applied in a crash. Um, so if you look at that, that group, that's actually um, still quite a high collision risk, uh, uh, injury risk, severe injury risk, at 30 to 40 kilometres an hour. That's where the big group is. That's quite slow yeah. uh, in, in terms of if you think about the, the speed limits and, and, and so forth for vehicles on the roads. And if you think about the, the injuries curves, that you, the classic injuries curves um, for pedestrians and, and for um, car occupants, which are really quite wide apart because the, the, the different um, uh, protection that's offered by the vehicle to those user groups. Um, but if you look at towards the lower end of the speed range in there, and that's going back to the 20 miles per hour that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, uh, so that 20 miles an hour is at the, at the level where the risk of fatality becomes 
very low, even for vulnerable road users such as pedestrians. And it's also below that level at which um, older occupants are going to be at, at elevated risk of fatal injury. So that 20 is plenty is um, very effective actually for all of the road users, not just for vulnerable road users. And it's my understanding, you know, over the last 10 years, the, the road deaths in the UK and, and Europe have, have plateaued, essentially, yeah. uh, apart from 2020, when there were um, atypical circumstances. But the risk for vulnerable road users has gone up. The injury rate for that vulnerable road users has gone up and, and the rate for vehicle occupants has gone down. Is what, What's your explanation for, for that? Um, well, as I said, the, the, the uh, rate for uh, vehicle occupants has gone down uh, as a result of a, an enormous number of requirements on, on, on vehicles and an enormous number of safety improvements. So that's through regulations, that's through things like Euro NCAP, um, and it's through manufacturers' own initiatives as well. Um, and there, there are fewer regulatory requirements <laughs> on vulnerable road user protection. It's more difficult to do something um, about that. So there are requirements on the, um, the bumper area to protect the knee from very disabling injuries, uh -huh. unlikely to be life-threatening, but very disabling. There's requirements on the um, bonnet leading edge, uh, top of the bumper area, to protect the pelvis and the thigh um, region. Again, relatively unlikely. It's possible for that to, to, yeah. to fatally injure you. And then the whole bonnet area, of course. Um, but also heads can go beyond that. They can strike the windscreen. Um, they can strike the A pillars. The A pillars are particularly uh, dangerous areas. Very, very stiff, very high loads apply to the head in that, that area. Um, so there are other things coming. So the general safety regulation in Europe is expanding the test zone for um, the, the heads for pedestrians. Um, over a wider area of the windscreen. So that will control the stiffness of the windscreen and reduce the risk of injury for those um, those collisions. But that's, yeah, that's that's a, a new introduction um, as of this year. Um, and that will take time, of course, to propagate through the, the fleet and make a, a difference to pedestrian and cyclist and other vulnerable road user injury risk. Right, right. Um, David mentioned regulation there, Jeff, and, and the general safety regulation, which includes you know, changes to, to crash structures, but also um, safety systems on the vehicles themselves, including intelligent speed adaptation, which, which Steve mentioned. So that, that applies to all new models from this year in Europe and all vehicles from, from 2024. How will this affect how speed monitoring technologies are used on the network if the vehicles all have a speed adaptation system? It's, it's an interesting question and it will have an impact, but it is not going to fundamentally change everything. And, then, and there's a number of reasons behind that. The, the average age of vehicles on the UK road network is between eight and nine years old. So simplistically, if you fast forwarded by eight years, only half of the vehicles would have this feature if this feature was going to make a huge difference. So there is the transition period and it's always journeys are uh, um, quite easy to visualize at the end and at the beginning but it's actually making the journey which is the which is the difficult part yeah. um, there's a further factor as well in that as I understand it certainly for UK vehicles it will be an opt-in type approach so you can override ISA within the vehicle uh, or you can disable ISA for your vehicle all of the time and as with so many safety features, the vast majority of people want to do the right thing. They want to get where they're going safely. Mm -hmm. And so many people will go along with um, something like that to help their journey. But they aren't necessarily the people that um, Steve and I regularly deal with. The people we deal with are the people that maybe willfully and knowingly do something outside of the envelope of what is sensible. And so I think you can reasonably assuredly think that they are likely to be the people that would disable or turn off something like that. Yes. And to that end, you still very much need an independent third party view to monitor, control, be aware when this is happening. Right. And it's a similar argument, I suggest, for when um, connected and autonomous vehicles come mm -hmm. in as well, because it will be much the same sort of approach. You can't assume that everything will be perfect. Some things will start to be wrong or people will willfully try to do the wrong thing, which is why I think there will always be the place for a third party validation, just checking, monitoring, overviewing what's going on. So that, that's, that's my view on, um, 
on how ISA will um, will impact this type of market. Brilliant. And David, I know TRL were involved in developing the the, the regulation, the, the general safety regulation, feeding information into the European Commission on how that regulation came together. Indeed. How does ISA, independent, the Intelligent Speed Adaptation Systems, work with other safety systems on vehicles to, to improve safety? Yes, yeah, so, so just to note that um, your NCAP have been encouraging fitment of ISA for uh, a number of years, so there are, there's a reasonable proportion of the fleet that does have ISA available already, not necessarily quite the same specification as required by the regulations. Um, and as you noticed, yeah, the, the, the regulation allows the driver to, to switch the ISA off. It will restart automatically the next time the, the vehicle is switched on, so it defaults to on. Um, and actually, when people have done studies, um, the, the system defaulting to on and controlling the speed rather than just giving a warning is actually what drivers like best. <laughs> it's the one that's most comfortable to use and it's easiest to use and it, it just gets on with helping you um, stick to the speed limits very straightforward and simple to use. Um, but going back to your, your question there, the, the general safety regulation, yeah, the, the ISA is really important to all of the um, measures that, that are there. So there's something like 17 um, vehicle technologies that are brought in by the updates to the general safety regulation. Um, and there's a very complex cost benefit model behind that. So normally you look at the costs and benefits of a vehicle technology before you bring a regulation in. It's got to be cost beneficial before we can bring a regulation in. But this would bring a whole package in of, of different measures. Um, so we had to work out how we, we had to make sure we were only saving each casualty once. Yes. <laughs> so there's quite a complex model there and, and it's built in layers. So ISA and a few other things um, are at the top layer. And then if, when those are effective, that reduces the target population for the next layer down, which is collision avoidance technologies such as automatic emergency braking. And then when those are effective, that reduces the target population, the people you can still save from things like improved crash structures in the vehicle or the, um, uh, the improvements to the windscreen area for the pedestrian um, safety regulation that, that I was mentioning as well. So it all, and an ISA enables every single one of those technologies below it to be more effective. If the vehicle is with, at a lower speed, it's within the speed limit, then the AB has more chance to avoid the collision in the first place. The crash structures have more chance to protect the occupant and the pedestrian safety part of the regulation has more chance to save the life of the pedestrian. So it's absolutely fundamental to the whole, the whole picture. And we're still waiting to hear how the UK will interpret Yes, so regulation. currently Europe gets all of that, but at the moment we're undecided. Yeah. And taking that political angle for a second, Steve, there was talk in the recent leadership hustings about cancelling smart motorways and removing speed limits. I mean, could that ever be compatible with a, a safe road system? And, and how might technologies affect that idea, particularly thinking about ISA? Well, it's probably a danger asking the technology man about politics. But, uh, <laughs> But uh, I shall give a frank answer. I think the politician, probably for every election for the last 20 years or so since I've been involved in this industry, seem to try and appeal to the base of human instincts of, of wanting to do what you want when you want to do it. And, and one of those is, is driving, driving your car fast for sport. Um, it, it, but uh, what I say is that um, the, the politicians really are looking at cheap, sound bites there and appealing essentially appealing to a, a very loud minority of people the the vast majority of drivers in my view already have what they want they've got a speed enforcement program which was in the safety camera program and now police and local authority led the the, the, the silent majority have got what they want so there's no reason to speak up so i think it's a it's a it's a dangerous mistake for politicians to try and grab votes by, by, by that essentially a cheap platitude. Um, it doesn't really follow that uh, I've never read any studies, including TRL studies. Um, I took trouble to, to read the, uh, the general, the, the new one about the intelligence by adaptation and the safety systems before I came here today. So um, I haven't seen any sort of studies, reports, research and testing that suggest higher speeds produce safer roads uh, generally the higher the speeds produces less safe roads yes. uh, it's less time to think less time between vehicles um, 
if you if you remove speed limits um, and quite often when you talk about removing speed limits in the popular press and the internet forums that motorists use they'll refer to the, the German autobahns yes. there's less than a third of the autobahns are, are de or unrestricted uh, two-thirds of it is restricted to 80 80 mile 81 mile an hour 130 mm -hmm. yes. so it has speed limits on there um, and some of it is has variable speed limits as well so if you if you remove uh, speed control speed restrictions you're likely to get uh, more speed differentials on the road more speed differentials gives you more congestion in the traffic more hold-ups less popular yes <laughs> all, all around Indeed. so i think it's 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 a very dangerous uh, route to go down mm -hmm. and uh, a, a very dangerous uh, political but the, the politicians may already be in with that vote but I, I very much doubt it because i think people who, who would go that way yeah. so as i said at the start a very a very low and small minority yes yeah jeff did you want to add yeah to it was just it's, it's a particular um topic I'm interested in and I, I've had some discussions with um, with Richard about it before but speed harmonization is very much a key indicator of safety and so um, ISA can largely harmonize vehicles because you haven't got some going very quick some going very so slow I'm surprised some people who make these comments don't understand it because a very simplistic way if you drive into a brick wall you will be in trouble but if the brick wall is traveling at the same direction that you are in the direction you're traveling then everything's fine mm -hmm. because there is very little speed differential it's as, as simple as that yeah. and so if you have technologies which are a can just keep vehicles flowing steadily and smoothly you get all of the benefits so the idea of making the top um, whatever somebody wants to drive at and the slower vehicles the hgvs will still be driving at 56 miles an hour mm -hmm. it is a big problem waiting to happen so I, I hope we don't go in the direction where this uh, this becomes considered appropriate and normal indeed indeed um changing direction slightly Richard um lower low and middle income countries and many of the crashes that happen around the world many of the, the deaths fatalities that, that occur are in those low and middle income countries speed harmonization is, is what we want to achieve with um uh, improving road safety in those countries. What technologies are being used to try to address safe speeds in those low and middle income countries? Well, as you'd expect, there isn't the level of public funding and investment available mm -hmm. and the proliferation of technology such as, you know, the things that um, we've seen here today from Unoptic just doesn't tend to happen in many of those countries. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, a lot of it is based on some of the old three E's that we used to use around education, um, enforcement and engineering. Yeah. Um, so you will typically see within uh, a lot of low middle income countries um, that engineering is a common approach that's used. Um, some quite rudimentary uh, engineering um, uh, implementations that you see with uh, speed bumps, etc. Um, very much, the, you know, old style um, engineering solutions which are effective because you have to slow down for them otherwise you're going to break your probably not seven or eight year old car maybe your 15 or 20 year old car or something like that so um yes I mean, obviously engineering out speed is the best way if you stop people speeding or you put in place a very strong incentive to make sure that people um adapt to the speed limit that's definitely one way forward yeah. but but there's a lot of roads out there and, and you can't protect all of them all the time using engineering because of the costs so enforcement is an opportunity and it might not be the fancy for want of a better word um average speed camera systems it tends to be um, more rudimentary handheld units that are operated by, by humans mm -hmm. because um, well, you know, the low middle income countries have much more availability of, of people to carry out this enforcement. Um, but then they also have their own priorities as well. And so, you know, I was looking at some evidence for a country where, um, you know, they received some consultancy advice and received some uh, funding from a big uh, global organization to get 30 new radar guns that were put inside that country. And they were trained up at the time and largely they'd spent their lives sat in the box because um, 
the officers in charge were directing traffic or doing something else. They had those other kinds of priorities in there. So it would be great if there were more automated measures, but then you need all the regulatory frameworks to go with it as well. So, yeah, you know, enforcement should be a way forward. It's certainly how we've seen massive reductions in casualties on our roads. Um, and it's certainly one that I would hope that um, low middle income countries would start to invest in more. And it's something, it's a, it clearly a trend, isn't it, where the cost of implementing speed monitoring technologies is coming down dramatically. So, you know, the cost of cameras, the cost of processing equipment, um, the cost of communications technologies, and the ability of the kind of uh, visual vision processing systems to capture that information is is now much more accessible. So, is is that an opportunity? You think the kind of Raspberry Pi smartphone based oh, speed monitoring? Absolutely. And there's some headlines recently about an app that you can get on your phone that you can just wave it to the motorist probably traveling down your street um, to detect what speed they're going at. And I don't know whether there's a button that you then press to report it to the police or something like that. That may be a little bit over the top, but there are definitely these technologies. We've been looking at cheap sensors that use Raspberry Pi devices that can classify, count and detect speeds of vehicles. And that's definitely a way forward in LMICs, for example, where they don't have access to this kind of information. And, you know, I, I would say that you need the data, you need the evidence because that spurs on the investment mm -hmm. and that helps people prioritise um, speed reduction. And one of the things, if we, if we think about the spectrum of, of technologies that can be used for speed enforcement, one of the popular emerging trends has been for these community speed watch groups to, to have that speed enforcement presence on the streets i mean what's what's your take on those kind of initiatives and, and their use of these low-cost technologies so yeah i mean community speed watch has been around in various type of forms or names or descriptions for a good number of years now yeah. i think um even when i was managing the the thames valley partnership there they were they were uh, being used by a number of pioneering councils and it's part of this mix this blend of speed enforcement speed management speed awareness whatever you want to call it um, so, uh, you know, you've got Jeff's technology at one end of the spectrum, which, you know, really rigorously enforces speed to make sure that tickets are sent out. And then at the other end, you've got, you know, you've got posters, you've got warning signs, you've got those um, vehicle activated signs that flash if you're over the speed limit and give you that immediate feedback. That's the, that's the softer side of things. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's where Community Speed Watch fits in. Um, and I think its value is, is as much as involving the community as providing you know the feedback to the driver obviously it does both of those things at the same time and certainly the thing that i've found from you know engaging with um, communities that are concerned about speed is that um, quite often everybody thinks that they have a speeding problem mm. um, so to be able to put the devices in their hands and for them to see for themselves what level of problem they have is really good um, and you know if there is a speeding issue then maybe just ramp it up a little bit and think about what the stick looks like a bit um, further up the enforcement chain. Yes, how you use the data that you're collecting, you could, you could uh, yeah, overwhelm the, the people responsible for enforcement indeed. Um, another technology, Steve, is, is the dash cam and ORSS are strong advocates of, of the use of dash cam. So um, do they have a potential role in, in safe speeds and enforcement? And is the information that they collect, can that be really genuinely considered to be at an evidential level thinking about your, your work in uh, enforcement? Yes, uh, I think that they do have a role. Like, um, so the deterrent effect is, mm. um, is, is strongest when, when a driver has a perception that they, they may be detected speeding. That's the, the strongest deterrent rather than a, a stick. If, you, if you brought in hanging for, for, for uh, excess speed, people would still exceed the speed limit. Um, that's not quite. Quite. Yeah, not quite. <laughs> yeah, certainly reduce the population of the uh, those, uh, people who speak, but they, they become in droves to replace them, I'm sure. But um, the, the severity of the, the punishment has an influence, but yes. it's very small compared to the likelihood of, of being detected. So we see the, the police uh, in the UK have rolled out, uh, the majority of police forces have rolled out what they call Operation Snap, which yes. is the use of Dutch car evidence from members of the public so um and that that kind of it, it works towards a general deterrent effect it's it's kind of the publicity behind it has been mm -hmm. kind of low key up to now but if if that gets uh, word gets around more and more then 
that that will have a greater effect in in France. They've they've gone kind of down the official route of this, where they've got approved radar systems fitted into police cars, mm -hmm. which are unmarked, and they go out among the general uh, driving uh, in the traffic that you can't detect which car has got the equipment in. But the, the French government made a, a huge splash that they were because in France they uh, sometimes they they're, they're very keen on. Uh, going against regulation mm -hmm. and uh, they get the yellow jackets on and, and cut things down. A lot of fixed speed cameras were being destroyed and, and, and put out of action. So the French government took positive action and said, well, if you're going to get rid of the, the, the cameras you can see, uh, then we'll start using them that you can't detect, you can't see, but they will be among you. Um, so that because you couldn't predict where the enforcement was going to take place, you couldn't predict Yes. where you could exceed the speed limit so it's very uncomfortable to manipulate speeds and that that reduced the fatality rate, rate of serious injury and massively reduced the rate of excess speed on french roads the dash cam has a similar principle you don't know which vehicle is going to have a camera in to it that's going to be report reporting you to the police so um that's that's the principle behind it. So mm -hmm. there's a, power, a very powerful powerful effect, but that's yet to be harvested and published at the moment. Uh, whether it's an evidential standard, uh, evidential is a is kind of a, a word that has uh, evidential has lots of levels, mm -hmm. um, from being no evidential use whatsoever to to um, evidence needs to prove whether a fact is true or false. That's what a, a court is going to decide. So if we can get evidence from a dash cam and you can use a witness to attest to how accurate it is, dash cams, uh, something of common, almost, almost every dash cam uh, evidence or video I've seen, I've seen probably thousands of yes. them now, um, I'm yet to find a clock that's unreliable and inaccurate. They're all uh, either 25 frames per second, 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second, 30 is the most popular. Uh, 60 and 25 about equal either side um, but there, that's more than adequate uh, time in between each image to calculate the speed if you can get a reliable distance yeah. and we're looking at pictures we're looking at fixed objects mm -hmm. within the pictures so you establish the distance between the fixed objects and you can calculate the speed from that it's very important when you calculate that to actually quote the uncertainty in that calculation yes. as well so whether it's going to be uh, 100 miles per hour for the subject vehicle, plus or minus one mile an hour, plus or minus five, or plus or minus 20, you need to quote what the inaccuracy or the uncertainty is for that. And you've got to be more sure of the uncertainty than you have of the actual yes. speed, yeah. in, in my view. And when I do the evidence, I always calculate an uncertainty either side. Um, but the, the evidence from them, we've tested them with reference equipment as well um, and we can we can get to within plus or minus one mile an hour with with dash cam evidence from dash cams that have cost between five and ten pounds so it's uh, very very accurate data yes. yeah. but it, it does need uh, more publicity about the amount of um, people that have dash cams probably every other vehicle has probably got a dash cam in it now because they're so cheap yeah. but they are a very very accurate source of timing Interesting. we've seen some um richard mentioned uh, the camera app we've we've done some fundamental tests on that and some other machine calculated uh, speeds from video but uh, they're not very encouraging at the moment so um but i'm sure we're in the right circumstances but uh, whether they can or can't be approved for use is um it would be put to the test if one actually applies and and is tested so yeah. i'm looking forward to seeing that yeah um i was interested there steve and, and, and jeff you might pick up on this so jeff was uh, sorry steve was talking about the french t taking the kind of inconspicuous approach mm -hmm. to, to speed enforcement whereas the uk shifted to a more conspicuous approach i think partly to have that visible presence to have that um to give drivers that awareness that there is speed enforcement present 
Can you tell us about that, that history and how that transpired? Um, the, the balance between conspicuous and yeah. covert. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I, well, we could we could have a very long um, <laughs> debate discussion around around this one because I feel once you've started on a particular path. So mm. in the UK, we have conspicuous overt enforcement, yes. and people now think that is there. I know why it's there. I understand it. There is a perception that if you can't see it and you don't know why it's there, then it's sneaky and it's hidden mm. and it's trying to catch you speed trap rather than um a safety a safety system and I, I know other countries operate in a completely different way and i think it maybe it can start from day one with an approach where it can be anywhere at any time yes. then it is maybe accepted in a different way where if you make a column bright yellow and then somewhere else you're hiding behind a bush supposedly it it becomes a difficult public relations issue. And I'm not saying there's a right and a wrong answer, mm. but I think we've got ourselves in the UK into a position whereby we, we tell people we're doing something and then there is a greater level of acceptance around it. If you are going to add that, and other people have different views on this, but if you're going to add to that covert locations, it becomes a different issue it becomes a different communication challenge yes. and as i touched on before if you communicate clearly with people and you say this is what i'm doing and why i'm doing it they're more likely to go with you than if you pop out from behind the bush and hit them with a stick but that that's very much my opinion okay okay that's, uh, yeah as you say that, that that topic could run and run couldn't it um, Again, shifting focus, David, to um, another emerging trend, the, the e-bikes, micromobility. I know TRL has been doing a lot of work, again, uh, with Europe on how that, uh, those types of systems should be categorised and, and regulated. In the UK, limited to 25 kilometres per hour, uh, just over 15 miles per hour. But you don't have to go far to see examples of these types of vehicle that have been modified and, and travel considerably faster than that uh, that limit and often in relation to, to gig economy work where there's an incentive mm -hmm. to get to your destination as quickly as possible how should we tackle safe speeds for these types of vehicle yes so uh, both the power of the vehicle uh, and the speed are limited in order mm -hmm. for it to qualify as a, an e-bike or an e-scooter and, and be exempt from insurance and um, uh, having a license plate and those those kind of things um, and DFSA, DVSA is very active in enforcing that. So there was a, they, they won a case last week, I think, against a manufacturer uh, forcing a recall of vehicles where they were found to have too much power and to be able to go at too high a speed. Um, and they've had several of those this, this year. So there's an, a kind of enforcement aspect to the, the manufacturer um, there as well. So importing or manufacturing vehicles that um, don't comply with those requirements um, becomes hopefully difficult or risky and therefore the only th vehicles you can buy, the only e-bikes or e-scooters you can buy are ones that do comply with, with those requirements. Um, there's a lot of um, e-scooter trials going on in the UK at the moment and some of those are um, setting different limits in different areas. So there's geofencing of the vehicle that's possible. Um, and that seems to be a very popular solution um, all, all around the world actually. and, and um, growing uh, in order to control speeds and make the the, the speed of an e-scooter and pedestrians and cyclists more compatible and therefore to reduce the risks that res result from big differences in speeds in, in a particular area. Um, that's more difficult to do with a private um, e-bicycle or a private e-scooter. Um, but you, you could have a, a, um, an app that you use with your own e-bike or your own e-scooter that helps you mm -hmm. uh, and at least provides you with the, the ability to um, geofence the, the vehicle and, and ride at a more appropriate speed. Somewhat like the ISA for the, <laughs> yeah, for the car. Um, so you, you could override the ISA, but it's actually um, so much preferable to, to use it and, and it, um, have that as an extra set of eyes, um, helping you to, to drive safely and comply with the, with the law. And, and Jeff, you, in the video earlier, you, you hinted about um, camera systems being type approved for one particular purpose. Is, do you think there's more value that we could get if they could be used for multiple um, uh, purposes? Yeah, it, it, 
it's a complicated area and I think everybody would agree that uh, the technology is there that could allow you to do many, many more things. And um, I know my, my experience for, for many years now, we've been thinking we could do this and we could do that. And there's this rich data that would allow you to do a lot more. But there are appropriate controls that um, with, with the UK that Home Office type approval will not allow you to do many things at the same time. And it's my personal belief that it's probably not practical to try to get one type approved device to do many things. Because for example, if you want to change the software, which does a nice little feature that isn't directly related to, let's say red light or the speed enforcement, the approved device has to be tested with that new software feature. And so if you want to change that software feature, the whole thing has to be right. retested and reapproved. So I, I personally think the, the answer is there's a lot of data. We talk about these being a data capture device, which happens to allow a violation record to be created. Yes. If we can find a way to appropriately package some of the data so it can go somewhere else and something can be done with it, that's probably the way to do this, rather than to try and put a big wrapper around and then it has to be tested in every possible configuration, every possible permutation combination. And then when you realize you just want to change it a little bit, because you have to have a checksum on the software, you've got to go back into it again. So, of course, there are many more things you could do with this technology, and it tends to be very good, very accurate technology, so you get really good data from it. But understandably, there are constraints on that. But, but I think it's using the data maybe in a different way, putting it somewhere secure that you can access in another way. I yeah. think that would be my, my suggestion. Okay. And... Richard, finally, I, I've got a couple of the audience questions I'd like to get to, but there is one I, I did want to, to pose to you. Um, and it, again, it's, it's a topic we could, spend, we could spend hours on, but, you know, safety is one consideration as far as speed limits go. But how fast you permit the traffic to travel is also kind of associated with productivity somehow, you know, how much value the road gives to society. Um, so if you lower a speed limit on a route, and a logistics company can't deliver as quickly as it could previously, um, you could argue that it's increasing their costs so, and they give a less efficient service. So how can technology help us kind of understand and, and optimise these trade-offs and, and think about what a safe speed actually represents? Mm. And yeah, you might, there's lots of different economic calculations in there and uh, lots of people that, that we've been working with recently looking at these economic calculations in, in different countries around the world where, you know, they have different values of life, um, you know, they have different costs of living, vehicle costs, etc. And then there's also the cost of carbon emissions and uh, um, other particulates, pollutants, etc. Um, so, yeah, there, there is a very big um, maths calculation out there that you can do um, where you can pick individual speeds and then decide what the right speed to be set at is. And uh, there's been some great work done in New Zealand, for example, a yeah, similar kind of place to us, good mixture of urban and rural roads. And uh, they're able to quite accurately define what the safe speeds look like. And, you know, so you do all this independent analysis and today you come up with the result that we've got at the moment, which is... You know, actually, probably, you know, motorway speeds are about right. The national speed limit that we have in the country, possibly a little bit too high at 60 miles an hour. It could be a little bit lower. But then you look at the speeds people travel on, they're 50 anyway. Mm -hmm. So people do tend to reduce their speeds um, according to the, the road environment. In terms of how the technology can help us on this, I mean, we've mentioned ISA quite a lot here. Um, I think there's possibly some role for giving feedback to people as well thinking about these other considerations. You know, talk about the cost of living crisis, the price of petrol and diesel has come down a tiny little bit mm -hmm. lately, but it's something that we're concerned about. And if there's some kind of feedback mechanism through your through your car, through your motorbike, whatever it is that you're driving, that tells you, uh, you know, that, that combination of risk and uh, economic benefit and, and disbenefit, of course, um, I think that would be a great limiter. The thing, the, the tip that I've got for anybody out there, right, if you've got your trip computer on, um, what you do is don't put it on the amount of time that you spend traveling change it so it shows you the current miles per gallon because that's a great way of getting you to just lift a little bit off that yeah. that right foot yeah. so yeah to... i'm really interested in those kind of positive feedback mechanisms particularly for, for fleets actually that you could 
provide that feedback. So, you know, the, your fleet was 99.8% compliant with the speed limit. So congratulations, those, those kind of things. I think there is, there could be benefit in, in those. But coming to the audience questions, um, someone's asked about you know, that we've, we've talked a lot about the ISA system, intelligent speed adaptation systems, but is the sign detection system, is the speed mapping, is that good enough at, the, at present? David, what do you think? Uh, I have ice in my car and it, it's, it's usually right. Uh, and it's often more right than I am. <laughs> so particularly through a town with um, swapping between 20 and 30 limits quite regularly, um, and particularly turning into a side road with the 20 limit, there's a lot to do when you're turning across mm -hmm. traffic, you're looking for pedestrians that are crossing the, the junction with the changes to the highway code earlier this year, they have priority, there's a lot to do. And it's, it's relatively easy to miss those signs. Um, uh, it doesn't miss them. <laughs> and smart so, motorways with very, variables and controlled motorways. Works with all variable variables, speed signs, yep, yeah, yeah, works very, very well. Uh, so it's, it's a fusion of, of camera data, uh, cam camera sensor and map data, and yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I, mean, I have a, a vehicle that detects signs, um, and I've actually been analysing connected vehicle data lately. So we were looking at systems from a manufacturer that in a small number of cases, it's, it's a fraction of 1%, but it does detect um, signs incorrectly, which is why you need that mapping data there, because sometimes it makes mistakes. It really doesn't like the LED signs. I was driving through one and it pinged up as 80. Was it really meant 30? And I wouldn't want my car suddenly accelerating to 80 in a 30 limit. So that's why you need to make sure that you've got the maps there. And it's why, you know, local authorities, if they're implementing 20 limits or reducing um, road, uh, national speed limit roads, they need to make sure that they're connecting with the mapping companies um, and the people that are collecting this data to make sure that it's updated, not, you know, next month or next year, but tomorrow, mm -hmm. especially if we're going to be relying on these kinds of systems. So, so that's critical as well. And as we move to automated vehicles, potentially that, that kind of update becomes ever more important. Um, and there's been another question. We've talked a lot about the, the political um, uh, involvement in, in setting speed limits and um, introducing ISA and so on. But what about the, the vehicle manufacturers, Jeff? Do, you know, do they have a responsibility to um, produce vehicles and advertise vehicles that are being used in a, in a safe and responsible manner? Well, I, I think there are conflicting requirements because the um, I haven't studied the uh, the marketing approach of the the OEM vehicle manufacturers, but there are some people who would buy a vehicle because it will keep them very safe and mm. because it will be compliant all of the time. Um, and then you've got a Venn diagram of some people who might be interested in the same type of vehicle, but they want to drive it how they want to drive it and they don't want to have um, controls and restrictions on them and so I imagine it must be challenging for the, for the motor manufacturers to try to market the same vehicle to the same people um, particularly if they're saying you can't do this and you can't do that when somebody when maybe someone else is offering that so once again it's a balancing act and it's understanding what people want yes. and making them buy, buying into what they they need from it and providing them something that is appropriate and hopefully as safe as possible. Um, one more question, Stephen. I think this, this one probably comes to you. Um, we talked about dash cams and um, how they're useful potentially in, in understanding speeds, but may, maybe question the kind of evidential level maybe. Have you seen someone try to use dash cam evidence to prove they weren't speeding, so to, to counter um, a, a potential speeding case? Yeah, I've, I've seen a, a very small number yeah. um, that have been submitted um, in that way. Um, the, 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 but, uh, I think probably two two occasions it was submitted, but it was essentially submitted at a different town and a slightly different location to where the speed was measured. So when you, <laughs> which, when you say that the, the GPS information that goes on the dash cam, it's usually updated once a second and there are there is a, a manufacturer that's putting a, a 10 hertz uh, update on the on the screen um can't say which manufacturer it is but there is one um and that's going to be a feature for them uh and it's possibly to to counteract speed enforcement activity um but essentially uh, a speed meter whether it's fixed or mobile will measure your speed apart mm -hmm. from average speed meters obviously but um, it will measure your speed in less than half a second. 
So you've got to match it to exactly ah. half a second that you were measured in yes. to actually make it effective. Uh, we get probably one or two challenges a week from uh, vehicle telematics data, yes. from commercial vehicles or from tachograph data. Yes. Um, it can be a mixture of both, sometimes both fit in a vehicle. And again, um, there'll be GPS reports, but it'll be reporting uh, either to a specific speed or vehicle change algorithm, or it'll be reporting once every minute or every two minutes. But when it reports the GPS speed of the vehicle and the telematics, it'll report for a fraction of a second at the report time. Mm -hmm. What happens in the minute between those reports uh, could be anything, yes. and, and it usually is. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you could measure, let's say, I don't know, 40 mile an hour for this minute, 40 mile an hour for this minute, and you also get a distance in that minute. And the average speed could be 60, but with two 40 mile an hour reports. Yes. Yeah. So um, it's got to be uh, a very quick update and it's got to be matched exactly to the police speed meter time and the police may not have their speed meters set exactly to the GPS coordinated clock to be handheld speed meters or speed meters that are handheld with with uh, video uh, capability on them may actually be offset so it doesn't match yeah. the, the GPS time so it can't be challenged but um, it, it needs to be matched exactly, so it's, it's usually um, every one I've seen, I've never seen one that's been successful yet. Interesting. So. Okay. Well, I mean, that's been, a, a, again, the hour has flown by and there's been many more avenues we could have delved down to, uh, to explore further. But it, it really just remains me to say thank you very much to our expert panellists who've joined us here at Genoptic, who've hosted us superbly here at, uh, at Camberley. We thank Bosch and Agilisys for their support in running these sessions. And we look forward to seeing you again at, uh, at our next uh, webinar, which will be on connected technology and multimodal transport and land use planning, hosted at the Smart Mobility Living Lab in London. And that is happening in October next month. So thank you very much for your attention. We look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Drive safely and see you again. Thank you.